think there's a definite throwback with some of them to, you, you know, suddenly the mellotron comes in and the flute comes in and you think, mm, that slightly reminds me a bit of, but no, I would say that's sort of 10% of it. No, 90% they've very much got their own voice. And certainly Big Big Train have got some phenomenal musicians as well. I mean, the, the virtuosity. I was lucky enough for them to do a cover of my song, Master of Time. It was only on DP. Well, it was only on a DP. A piece of people might have missed it. But it was brilliantly done. Really, really, really brilliantly done. Yes, I think there's um, um, also the standard of playing on some of this music is really, really good as well. And it's not... Well, self-indulgent is one of these is one of these subjective terms, isn't it? Really, if you like what someone's doing, it's not self-indulgent. If you don't, you can say it's self-indulgent. It's a bit like pretentious. I mean, maybe some things are obviously pretentious if you're trying to be really something you aren't. But that's another that's another pretty subjective subjective term. But just how far um, this music can stretch in terms of its appeal remains to be seen. Um, I mean, the media is, you know, it is, it's down, isn't it? So much of this is to, uh, like, like it's always been with music, really, which is availability and people hearing it. Um, probably the vast amount of people in this country have never heard of Big Big Train. Now, if you were to play their CD to, you know, every, how many people would buy it? We don't know. So, so your challenge is always to try and, as ever, is to, to get the music heard by as many people as possible. Which is why one of the, um, as I'm sure you know, the big buzzwords now is this dreaded word sync, synchronization, because of visual things being so important, so dominant. If you get your music used in a classy advert, I don't mean a, you know, with one with a bit of mystique, you get a big buzz on, on all the social media. What's that piece of music? A lot of people have taken off through some, what we call sort of secondary usage, if you like, underpinning something else. It's got to be classy, but, but that's a way of propelling you outside the relatively narrow, I think, media that's available in a lot of these things like prog. You know, there's only a certain amount of news, you know, with, uh, the organs, you know, that deal with it, whether visual or, or written. Um, that, I think, is frustrating. It's always been frustrating. It always will be. And it's why um, everyone's, everyone so often is trying to get the music used in something that, that will propel them. Um, more into the mainstream, not because they want to necessarily be hugely commercial, commercially successful and on everyone's lips, but you just want to, there's a frustration about, you know, most people, the man in the street has heard of Ed Sheeran and Taylor Swift and they've, they've probably listened to their stuff and had a chance of saying, I like it or else I don't, whereas the vast majority of people don't know my music and probably don't know Big Big Train's music. So I think it's quite understandable to think, well, what are the ways of getting this, this, this music um, heard? I suppose getting the music used in a big film would be, would be another way. And indeed, I mean, I personally think a lot of the best music around is, is film music, where you get, a, you get a sort of a natural marriage between often quite rocky forms and quite classical, and there's no sort of concept thing or any fusion or any of that nonsense it's just you know you've got different sections i think for a lot of bands uh getting you know getting a music used in the film is is, is tough very tough as i know so so we all you know, we all plod on trying to expand the audience if we can it was lovely actually because andy's andy's mum knew my mum, that's how it happened, and when I moved to Clapham, Andy was, was just over the other side of the common, and it was interesting because he'd hit, he'd hit a kind of a, well not a wall with Camel, but there was a kind of, um, there was a watershed time, I think the drummer had left or, or gone his own way or something, and um, Pete Bardens, I think, had left and was doing his own thing, so it was a time of... Um, flux for Andy, what do I do? Do I keep going in the same way uh, or do I try to slightly change? Also look at the year, it was 81 and um, prog is now not, not fashionable. Um, I say prog, it wasn't called that then, but that kind of music was, was being threatened. So the pressure was on definitely even, you know, uh, to actually do shorter, shorter form things. Um, 
and inevitably, you know, singles, which is why he ended up by calling the album The Single Factor, which was partly ironic, but, you know, people were just coming back to this, and it was all rather silly looking back on it, because I don't see why things had to be as sort of monotheistic as that. It's like there was suddenly everyone's got to be doing the same thing. You know, it's probably well known that my album Sides was going to be called Balls, because of the cover with the football table, because I got so fed up with people saying, oh no mate, it hasn't got enough balls in it. And you think, well hang on, this is ridiculous. You know, we've moved on from that around the time of day in the life. You know, we've moved on from that. You know, everything's got to have balls. And music became more florid, more interesting. It's horses, of course it's not. It doesn't have to be one way. And there was this horrible sort of everything's got to be, and I think a lot of people were quite frightened. A lot of people were running scared, you know, of the kind of new eras. They're all going, oh, a lot of toadies. People, I suppose they are worried about their jobs and stuff, but it was a lot of people pretty damn disingenuous and pretty um, weak spirited. But I suppose if you're trying to save your own skin, but I think, yeah, Andy was very much affected by that as well. So we tried some longer things, we tried some longer things, but the pressure was was, was definitely against that. So um, the the tracks, they, I mean, they weren't all pop songs, but they were shorter and tighter. And I, some of the compositional ideas I put forward just got rejected. And that was fine, I, I, you know, I understood this. He was experimenting. But I think what was a little bit tricky was that those of us that were working with him, we were not, not guinea pigs, but we were slightly, we were sort of going along with seeing which way he would go. And in the end, I think we had, of all the things we wrote together, only the outro to One Piece was, was kept, which is nice. We did another quite sort of rock ballady, slightly hymny thing that got got pushed out as well. I didn't have any resentment about it because I, I completely understood the process. I was also being paid you know, as a session musician as well, so um, it was nice. And we, it was fun working with lots of different musicians like David Payton. Um, and um, we were at EMI at the time when Alan Parsons was there and going into the old Beatles studio, which I've been into actually when I was 11 or 12, because my dad knew Sir Joseph Lockwood and we got, myself and my dear friend Rivers got invited along to a Swinging Blue Jeans se session. And in fact, we are on hand claps on Hippy Hippy Shake. Yeah. They were the nicest guys. It was so bizarre because my father, who's a city gent, here he is on a Sunday morning driving Norman Cook, I think his name was the, the singer, around London trying to find something for his throat because they had to do the Enemy Pole concert. And they were great guys. They were so nice. So back to Camel. It was it was great fun. I really enjoyed working with Andy. He was a very funny guy. Uh, delightful chap to be with. We were quite naughty as well. I remember going to EMI one in the evening when somebody else was doing something. He had a big a big studio with all the orchestral stuff. So all the mics were outside, and we played frisbee with with, with snare drum heads across the. But it was good fun, and Andy was an absolute delight. But you know, the pressure was on, and um, so the very little compositional ended up on that. And I think because I wasn't going to go on the road anyway, it was there was never much future to that that going on really. We never fell out. There was no falling out at all. Delightful guy. <laughs>